morning, Oak Park Church. Wherever you may be this morning, would you just join us in worship and lift up the name of Jesus with us today?
Praise the Lord. What a joy it is this morning that we are at Oak Park Church in campuses all over the city, all over the county, all over the nation and the world. And you are a part of what's happening this morning at Oak Park Church, wherever you are. I hope you have your family gathered around you. And I hope that uh, you have others that you've invited to come and be a part of this wonderful service today. And just like last Sunday, it's much different than normal. It's a new normal for this season. But I believe just like last week, we're going to see a move of God all over this nation and all over this world as you watch. Last week, we had people watching from literally all around the world. I talked to some, uh, one family that was watching from Italy. They were in quarantine, and they were watching our church service last week. What a joy, what a privilege it is to go beyond the four walls of this building and to go where you are and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And today we're going to worship, we're going to sing, I'm going to preach, we're going to, where you are, you're going to engage, and we're just going to have a wonderful time giving praise and glory unto the Lord. I want to welcome you, first of all, today, and thank you for tuning in, for watching, ever how you're watching, whether it's by Roku, Apple TV, through the website, uh, on Facebook Live, on YouTube. There's a lot of different ways that you can tune in. So ever how you're watching, thank you for doing that. If you're watching by Facebook, can I ask you to do something very, very important right now? This will allow our outreach, this service, to go far beyond its borders right now. If you're watching by Facebook, would you go down below the video and click share and share this. When you do that, there are a lot of your friends who may not be connected to our church Facebook. And if we could have about 300 of you or 500 of you that would share the video, then that will expand the audience today and more people will hear the praise, the singing, the worship, and the word that's going to go forth out of this room today. I'm standing today in the church, the little C, the building, the church building, but I'm speaking today to the church, capital C, and you are the people who make up the church. And the Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So as you share, I want you to do one more thing with me. Share to your Facebook site, and then you're going to be reaching people that are your friends, that care about you because they're your friends on Facebook, and many of them may not know the Lord. So why don't you tag them in that comment section when you share, and then engage them. Begin to talk to them, and if they need prayer, pray with them. Today, you're our altar workers. You are the elders and the deacons and the prayer warriors, the intercessors. Today, you are the pastor in your campus church, your home, and you have the ability through your Facebook page to really be a blessing today to those who are watching. So please do that for us. Also today, if you're watching and you've never been in this building and you're maybe coming across our church for the first time, uh, would you do me a favor? We have a, a website now, it's different than our regular church website, that is a page filled with all the resources. We're just communicating this website address for all of the things that you need to be able to worship uh, with OPC at home. And that web address is that simple. It's opcathome.tv. OPC at home.tv. It's on the bottom of your screen, and you can go to that address. It'll have uh, the live stream, it'll have ways you can give, uh, other resources that are there, our children's ministry, and that we're going to be doing all throughout this season, our student ministry. It'll all be there on one page. The main thing today is if you've never connected with our church until now, would you click on the icon that says next? And would you just fill out that form and let us know that you're watching? We do that every Sunday when we're gathered in this building, and we would love to do that today virtually so that we know that you're there. And so I'm, I'm, it's time to make announcements, so I'm going to make a couple of announcements. One big announcement um, of something we did yesterday that we are planning to do this coming Saturday as well. Every Saturday, as long as the authorities and the, and the social distancing allows us to do it, we'll be meeting every Saturday at 10 a.m. from 10 o'clock until 3 o'clock for a time of gathering and prayer in our parking lot. It's drive-in church, and it'll only be 30 minutes, and it's a prayer service. 
Uh, so we would love for you to join us this week for the second week of that, this Saturday at 10 o'clock. Now stay in touch with uh, us through all of the other ways of connecting to make sure that that's still on, but we're announcing that today. I want to encourage you through Facebook, again, through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Roku, Apple TV, through our website, opcathome.tv. If you'll please stay connected uh, and read your emails that you get from us, we're not going to give you, we're not going to bombard you and overwhelm you because I know you're getting that from everywhere. But when we do send you something, it will be very, very uh, practical. So thank you for that. Now let me give you an opportunity today to worship the Lord in a very special way. And let me first of all say thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithfulness. There's not a more faithful church on this planet than Oak Park. And this week, as you well know, everyone has been affected financially by this uh, season that we're in with the coronavirus. We never dreamed uh, that we would be doing things this way. Someone said to me today, they said, did you imagine two weeks ago when we changed the time that we went from standard time to twilight zone? <laughs> and that's what it feels like. And we're in a crazy world doing things like we never dreamed we would do it. But it's exciting because the church is stretching ourselves to be able to, to really do it the way we're called to do it. And that's to go from house to house, breaking bread and preaching the gospel. They did that in the book of Acts in Cornelius' house. The Bible says in Acts 10 that Peter, when he spake the words, there was only a handful of people gathered at Cornelius' house in Caesarea. And the Bible says when Peter yet spake, as he stood in that house, the gospel went forth to the Gentiles and the Holy Ghost came into that house and baptized them. Paul was in Ephesus and there were only about 10 or 12 people in that room. When Paul began to speak and he asked them in, uh, at the, in, in Acts chapter 19 at the church of Ephesus, have you received since you believe? And there in that house, in that place, they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I believe today in your house, your car, wherever you may be watching, you can be saved, you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost, you can be healed, miracles can take place right where you are. There is no distance to prayer and no distance to where the Holy Spirit will go. So thank you. Last week we made a plea to you to help us as you were able with your giving, and you did. It wasn't, we, we just, your response was incredible. People brought their offerings, people gave online, and uh, somebody said, well, how was your giving? I said, it was just enough. We made the cuts and we adjusted the things we needed to adjust. And just like every week, I said, I know, I told Pastor Shane today, I know God is more than enough, but I praise him for being just enough this week. And I want to encourage you, if you're able to give, if you're able in this season to give, I'll tell you, you can't outgive God, even in a time like this. I said last week that Isaac, the Bible says in Genesis, that Isaac sowed in a time of famine and God gave him a hundredfold return. And I just believe that the faithfulness of God is true in the good times, it's true in the bad times. He's God on the mountain, he's God in the valley. And as you give to the kingdom of God, to the house of God, you're not giving to men or women or to a building or a facility or an organization, but you're putting it in the hands of God. And I read in the Gospels when a little boy that had a sack lunch with just a few loaves and some fish put it in the hands of God, that little became much. And that's exactly what God will do for us. He'll take it, he'll provide, he'll break it, he'll bless it, he'll give it, he'll meet the need. And then after he met the need, there were remnants that were left over. And I believe that's what God's going to do for you. If you'll just put it in the hands of God today and trust him, that's what I'm doing. That's what Kim and I are doing. That's what our family's doing. We're continuing to be faithful in our giving to the Lord because I know that in times like these, the seeds that we have sown are going to produce a harvest in these moments. And they'll do the same thing for you today. So you can give today by going to OPC at home. Dot TV. When you go there, you'll see the giving icon. You can click on that and very quickly, you're right there where you can give digitally or you may bring it by the church. We will be here during regular office hours. That's our plan and many of you have chosen to do that. Or you can mail it in and the address will be on the screen. It is 3321 Solly Road, Mobile, Alabama, 36695. From the bottom of my heart, let me say thank you for your faithfulness. God's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of his church. I have zero doubt that God is in charge of all of this. And this is his will. And you hear me say it all the time. If it is his will, it's his bill. 
and he's going to pay it through us because if he gets it to us, he'll get it through us. And he's going to get it to us because he's faithful like that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. Thank you for the privilege that we have today to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Lord, we're continuing. Just this week, we fed first responders and blessed our hospital workers, our nurses and physicians and those who are serving so well during this time. Lord, we help assist people who needed groceries and food and others that have been in need. We've continued to do ministry even at a greater level than we did before this. So, Lord, I know that we're doing your work and you're going to take care of your work. And so I thank you for taking care of your people. I bless every gift, every giver, and I bless this church. And I know that you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that will provide all of our needs. And we give you praise, glory, and honor for that in Jesus' name. Now we're going to continue to worship. I want you to come on in your living room. Now you can't do this in your car. Keep driving. But if you're in your living room, stand up. Clap your hands. Amen. Kick that coffee table out of the way. And let's have church today. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Aren't you thankful this morning that we serve a God that is faithful? He's our Savior. He's our defender. He's our healer. Whatever you have need of this morning, He's there.
on right where you are right now begin to declare become hell or high water I don't have to fear it's faith over fear worship over worry praise over panic God's on his throne he's exalted Satan is defeated Jesus is Lord regardless of what Fox CNN MSNBC CBS NBC or ABC may say to you God is on his throne nothing has caught him by surprise and he knows where you are, he knows what you have need of, and he knows how to get the miracle to you. And today, I just want you to have the joy of the Lord, it's your strength. I want you to know that God is up to something incredible through this. And today, I wanna comfort you, I wanna give you the peace of knowing that there's nothing that's going on in this world right now that is a surprise to God. I had someone tell me many years ago that nothing happens unless it cross God's desk and he has to sign off on it. He's in control. He's large and in charge over every minute detail of this universe. And so he knows where we are. He knows what we're going through and he will be glorified through this. And so today, right now, I want to pray for you. Maybe you're just kind of going through Facebook or flipping through Roku or you're, you're searching and you landed right here for just a moment. I don't believe anything is by accident. I believe that it's sovereignty that brought you here. I believe it's the divine providence of God that brought you here for this moment. And I want to tell you that during this entire service this morning, there's a number at the bottom of your screen. You see that number, 251-633-6110. And as you call that number, there's going to be someone there to answer your call. If the call, if the lines are busy or you roll over to a voicemail, leave a voicemail. We'll call you back. But someone will be there to pray for you because in this time, we're staying together as a church family, even though we're not physically together. Thank God for technology and thank God for the ability to stay connected. And I love you and I'm praying for you. And through all of this, God will be glorified. Thank you so much, praise team. And uh, uh, thank you so much to the band for being here and uh, to be able to present this service to you. I want you today, if you have your Bibles at home, I want you to gather all of your, all of your family together if they're not right now. We did this last week, and I just believe that right now would be a good time to do it again. And I, before I even break the bread of life and open up the Word of God tonight, and this morning rather, to preach, I want to I wanna pray. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that your hearts right now will be cleared, your minds will be cleared to be able to receive what God has for you and what he wants to speak into your heart today. So wherever you are, last week I saw a beautiful picture that was shared of someone who was mowing their yard, listening, and they just stopped the lawnmower, and what a blessing that was to me. And they, they prayed over their family, that father did, that dad did, and 
Today, I want you to stop right where you are, bring the family as close to you as they can get, and I want us to have a moment of prayer right now as a church family. I want you just to imagine with me that we're standing right here and that we're able to, to grab hands with our neighbor and we're able to come into agreement. I want you just to imagine that because I'm going to tell you in a few weeks when we're able to get back in this church and as soon as all of the regulations will loosen up on us, I'm going to tell you you've never seen such Church of God neck hugging and handshaking in your life and high-fiving as we're going to do. We're going to have a time when we get together and it's going to be awesome. But in the meantime, let's have a virtual prayer chain and a connection right now. Get the hands of your family. Put your arm around them. And let's pray right now that God will just give us a peace. And let's pray specifically for this virus to go. I'm going to tell you, just before I get in the Word, I'm going to tell you what I, what I have been saying. I told this worship team just a moment ago. I'm asking God just to give such a supernatural cure for this virus that everybody, the whole world has to say that had to be supernatural. That had to be God. I believe He can do it. Come on, gather your family and let's pray right now. Dear Lord, we come to you today agreeing as two or three that agree us touching one thing. And Lord, we pray. Lord, we first of all, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor that you're in control. Come hell or high water, as the song was just saying, I don't have to fear or worry because you're still on your throne. And God, today you're exalted above all. You're exalted above disease. You're, you're exalted above depression. You're exalted above difficulty. You're exalted above any kind of debt. Lord, you are Lord of all, Lord of our finances, Lord of our health. You are Lord of this world. And God, right now, we pray against this coronavirus, the COVID-19. Lord, we've never experienced anything like this. And could it be that maybe in this season that you are designing ways for us to be able to come closer as families and as, as people of God to find ways that we can be more connected? Lord, the whole world has stopped on a dime. And right now, our focus is on you. And our focus is on being one nation here in the United States, to be one nation, united. And tonight, God, we unite under the banner of faith and your word. And we ask you to bless us, to bless each family, and to bless your time and your word tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles tonight or this morning, I want you to turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 21. And I want to read just a few verses, and, and I realize that sometimes when uh, I'm speaking to you over a camera, I don't want to read too many verses, I, but I do want to read a few verses tonight. And so please just indulge me as we read about five verses, and then I want to dive right into our message tonight. I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 21, and verse 10. It says in uh, 1 Samuel, chapter 21, verse 10, it says, Then David arose and fled that day. From before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gat. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did not they sing to him, uh, sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart, and he was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gat. So he changed his behavior before them pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see, the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them and there were about 400 men with him. One more verse. Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab and he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and my mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. So he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. And the prophet of, God, of Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold, depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went to the forest of Hereth. 
I want to speak tonight out of that text and to your situation tonight because I heard somebody this week say, I feel like I'm in a cave. They were, being, they were quarantined at home. And they said, I feel like I'm just living in a cave. And so tonight, I want to go to this story, and I want to talk to you tonight about how do you behave in a cave. See, David, when we read this text, the story that I took a little time to read to this morning, when I read that, I want you to understand the context. In that particular passage, David was anointed to be king. Now, he was not yet king. He was only anointed to be king. The oil had flowed from Samuel's horn of oil, and it had flowed down David's head and his beard, and he had been anointed to be king, but yet he had not yet been positioned. It's interesting that this past Wednesday night, we played a very special service for you, and that was intentionally. It's very strategic. It was a replay of a service from the first of the year when Aaron and Amanda Crabb came, and we talked about Focus 2020. And there were some prophetic words given over this year. And there were some prophetic words that were given over all of us as a church and what God was going to do to bring our focus to him in 2020. It's amazing to me that you may look at your situation now that we're walking through in this season and say, well, how can any of that be true with what we're going through? But the reality is God has blurred all the things that had priority in our life. As a matter of fact, he's moved them out of the way. If your priority was sports, you don't have it anymore. If your priority was, uh, was uh, going to Broadway shows, you don't have that anymore. If your priority was going to a concert, you don't have that anymore. If your priority was the work of the Lord and you had forgotten the Lord of the work, you don't have that right now in the, in the traditional sense. But what God has done is focused us together on trusting him in this season. So that word over this year is being fulfilled, that prophecy. So David is anointed to be king, and he's living in the castle. And then it seems like overnight he goes from living in the palace to living in a cave. Overnight, from overnight he goes from eating at the king's table to living in a cave in a place of desperation and famine. And, and I can dare say he can't find the toilet paper, and he can't get any ground beef, and and, and when Dixie's out of the necessities that he gets accustomed to, everything has changed. He's no longer eating pheasant under a glass. Now he's, he's trying to survive. He's in a cave and he's running for his life. He finds himself in this cold, dingy cave. He'd been promised to be king. The Lord had told him, Samuel had anointed him. The oil flowed over him and said, you're going to be king. But now he's in a cave. Isn't it amazing the similarities of what some of you may be thinking yourself today? Because you may feel like you're in a cave yourself. And right now you may be questioning your spiritual geography. Lord, why are we going through this? And we're asking all the wrong questions. We're saying, Lord, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? Why can I go shopping like I want to go shopping? And why can't I go to my favorite restaurant? And why can't I travel? All those kind of things. See, David had been promised something. But now he's living in a cave, and it would be easy for him to give up on the promise. I've said this many, many times. I'm going to say it right now. Your situation does not determine your destination. God has a plan for you. His thoughts towards you are good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. And what, what do you do when everything is going along just fine and you find yourself in a cave? Everything's going just fine and all of a sudden the whole world stops turning and everything changes and you find yourself in a cave. What do you do when you're in the cave? Well, you have to learn how to behave in a cave. You have to learn how to respond. I said it last week that we can't control trouble coming our way, but we control how we respond to trouble. So David learned how to behave in a cave and there's a difference between being in the cave and getting the cave in you. And so I want, to tell, I want to say that again. There's a difference between being in the cave and letting the cave get in you. Notice that in 1 Samuel 22 and verse 5, the text that we read, the Bible says, the king said to David, he said, don't stay in the stronghold. He said, don't stay in the stronghold. He was in Moab. Moab was the stronghold. Moab is a type of sin. I want you to unpack that verse with me. He said, don't stay in Moab. Don't stay in the stronghold of sin. But he said, depart. And get up to the land of Judah. Judah means praise. 
I believe God's saying the same thing to you today. I believe he's saying don't get stuck in the stronghold. Don't get stuck in the stronghold of depression or discouragement or fear or anxiety. But go up to Judah. Judah means praise. Go from doubting to shouting. Amen. Go from, go from a victim to a victor and declare that I'm going to have the joy of the Lord and I'm going to praise God even in the valley. See, David was in hold. He was waiting on God's direction for his life. The whole nation right now is in a holding pattern. We're waiting. We're waiting on someone to tell us when we can go back to life as usual. When can we go back to church? Some of you, when can I go back to work? And we're waiting on somebody to give us direction. But you have to understand that these moments are very special. If you'll acknowledge and recognize that the moment you're in right now, don't don't, don't neglect the moment that you're in. God is giving you a season, a moment to reflect on some things. Here's what the Lord told me about the cave. The cave is a place where you begin to question, Lord, what am I doing here? God, why am I going through this? When you're in the cave, if you're not careful, you begin to compromise. You begin to stop doing the disciplines that you were doing before you found yourself in the cave. It's a place where your future, when you're in the cave, your future becomes clouded. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what next week or next month. And we, this uncertainty causes our, our, our drive and our vision to be clouded. When you're in the cave, it's a place where you have to muster up all of your strength just to get through another day. And the Bible says that during this time that David encouraged himself in the Lord. See, sometimes you may not have anybody there to pat you on the back and to tell you how good you look and to tell you how good you're doing. Amen. But there's times when you just have to pull yourself up and you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. Maybe just go to the bathroom, look in the mirror and say, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord. Nobody else is going to say it to you. So you might as well declare that over your own life. Just declare you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Amen. So, so now who does God send David in this time of persecution and peril? You're, the text we read in 1 Samuel 22 and verse 2 says that it says that God brought him those who were in debt, those who were discontented, and those who were distressed. Now, if things weren't already bad, David said, Lord, send me some help. And who does God send him? People who were in debt, people who were distressed, and people who were discontented. One thing I've learned is the good time crowd will always be around you when everything's going good. But it's in the lean times when those people who were just there for what you could provide them, they dissipate, they disappear. But it's in these lean times, one of the lessons that we learn through this is you discover who really cares. You discover who really loves you. You, you discover who really has a heart for God. So David, God sends David some people who are not after David's anointing. They're, after, they're wanting to follow David's leadership. And they were distressed, discontented, and in debt. And th those are the people that know how to fight. Here's some things I've learned about the cave. In the cave, the cave is the birthplace. It's a place where birth is given. Uh, here's what I've discovered in this season for our church and for churches all over this nation and for you. I've learned the reason we're able to, just seems like overnight, our church has been able to put into action some things that we've been planning and talking about. But like overnight, we were able to hustle to get these different ways of getting the gospel out to you because the cave is a birthplace of some things. The cave is the birthplace of priorities. It causes us to reflect on what is the main thing and what is not the main thing. The cave, it's a birthplace of prayer because when you're in the cave, you learn how to trust God. You learn how to pray effectual, fervent prayers. The cave is a birthplace of purpose. You discover what God is doing in you. It's a birthplace of praise. You ever seen somebody that just praises God with a radical praise? If you'll talk to them long enough, you'll discover that that praise is not a show, but that praise was birthed out of a cave experience. It was birthed from going through a season where they trusted God and God brought them out and now they can't keep it to themselves. I believe somebody, God is birthing a praise inside of you. Even right now in this season, you've got a choice. You can get bitter or you can get better. And I believe there's some of our Oak Park family and those who are watching right now, you've made your mind up, your heart up, your focused that I'm going to be better through this. I'm going to develop my praise. And then it's a place of 
power because it's in these moments that we see that God is in control. We recognize that it's not by might, it's not by man's power, it's not by man's intellect. We have the most intelligent people in the world working on coronavirus. We have some of the greatest leaders navigating us through this situation. But at the end of the day, they're all depending on the one who controls the breath that we breathe. And God is in control and we discover his power. So David begins to understand those priorities. And David said, God, why am I in this cave? And I believe the Lord said, because I'm making a king out of you, boy. And soft men live in castles. And if you want to get ready for what I have ready for you, then you have to go through some things to prepare you for the process that leads you to purpose. And if you're going to reach your destiny, you have to be willing to go through the journey that takes you to your destiny. I believe that the, the cave is the birthplace of creativity. It's a place where you begin to think about things. There's a text that David wrote when he was in the cave. Much of the Psalms was written from this cave during this time. And David wrote over in Psalm 57, he wrote that chapter, that psalm, while he was in the cave and he was fleeing from the king of Gat. And the Bible says, let me read just a few verses of that at a time. He says in Psalm 57 verse 1, as he's, uh, as he's fleeing from Saul into the cave, he says, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trust in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge, watch this, until these calamities are past. I want to I share with you very quickly, very, very quickly, just a few things, seven things that serve as anchors while we're in this cave. And the first thing is found in that verse that you need to know. Cal this calamity shall pass. Come on, turn to somebody in your living room, if there's nobody besides you, then just speak to yourself and say, these calamities shall pass. David said, Lord, you're going to protect me. We quoted Psalm 91 last week. David said it again right here in 57 verse 1 of Psalm. He said, you're going to hide me in the shadow of your wings and I'm going to be protected. Read Psalm 91 and you'll understand that verse. And you're going to hide me there until this calamity is past. Whatever we're facing right now, this too shall pass. It won't last always. It will pass. Some of the, you know, some of the, David said, I will worship you until this passes. While I'm in this holding pattern, he said, I'm going to worship you. And some of the greatest psalms that were written, think about this, some of the greatest psalms that were written were written by David when he was in this cave. Songs like, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth, was written in the cave. Psalms like this one I'm reading, Psalms like, I will, uh, uh, Psalms like to praise him in the sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power, on the psaltery, the harp. All of those psalms were written when David was in a time of distress. The, the cave is a birthplace of creativity. Some of the best songs that have ever been written were written in times of distress. Paul wrote most of his encouraging epistles from a prison cell when he was in a crisis. It's in these moments where God is sheltering you and he's inside of you creating uh, creativity that will go beyond this moment. Number one, these calamities shall pass. And then Psalm 57, the second verse, David says, I will cry out to God who performs all things for me. I will cry out to God who performs all things for me. The second thing you need to know is this. There's a purpose in the process. You're not just going through, we're not going through this for no reason, for no purpose. There is a purpose on the other side of this process. What about, what about Joseph? He was thrown into a pit and it would look like his life was over. You see it all through the Bible. You see Paul in prison. You see Joseph in the pit. You see Daniel in the lion's den. You see the Hebrew boys in a fiery furnace. You see the children of Israel in the wilderness. We see that repeated over and over. We see Noah and his family trapped in an ark. We see it over and over. But there's always purpose attached to the process. Think about Joseph. If Joseph hadn't went to the pit, it looked like that was the end. He's in a grave. A pit is a grave. He was in the pit, but if he hadn't went to the pit, 
he would have not been sold into slavery. And had he not been sold into slavery, he would have not went to Potiphar's house. Had he not went to Potiphar's house, he would have not been falsely accused. Had he not been falsely accused, he wouldn't have ended up in prison. Had he not went to prison, he would have never met the baker and the butcher. Had he not met the baker and the butcher, he would have never interpreted their dreams. Had he not interpreted their dreams, they would never have introduced him to Pharaoh when Pharaoh said, is there anyone who can interpret my dreams? And had he not been introduced to Pharaoh, he would have not been able to interpret his dreams. And had he not interpreted his dreams, he would have not been promoted to second in command in Egypt to redeem his people and to save many alive. I feel like shouting up here all by myself and telling you that God has a purpose for this process. And I want to tell you, be encouraged. Come on, encourage yourself in the Lord. Let me encourage you and tell you that God is going to bring you from this to what he has for you. And what we're going through right now in this moment changes nothing. God is on his throne. He's still exalted. Satan is still defeated. He's still on his way to hell. And we're still on our way to heaven, those of us who know him. So there's purpose in the process. Come on, right where you are, give God praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So God will bring about his purpose for me. Listen, people that find themselves in a cave, they don't need, they don't need condemnation nation they need love that's why today I you know there's a lot of thoughts that I have about this moment that we're in and I can promise you when we get out of it a little bit I'll talk about them but right now I feel like I feel like God is instructing me just to speak love and to speak hope and to speak joy and to speak encouragement because I believe that when you're in that cave you don't need condemnation and that's what he says in Psalm 57 and verse 3 the third verse he says, God, David says, and this is from the cave, he writes this, God will reward me and bring to pass his purpose for me, and he will surely complete them. I want to tag on to number two and just tell you that God will bring about his purpose for your life. No question, no doubt, because God's not man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. If God said it, that settles it, period. And God said it over your life. There's a prophecy hanging over your head. And that prophecy is still there, and it will be fulfilled. And then the Bible goes on, and it says that, he says, David says later that God will silence the voice of the slanderer. Number four is this, the devil may delay it. I'm talking about your purpose. The devil may delay it, but he will not defeat it. I said the devil may delay God's purpose for you, but he will not defeat it. He doesn't have the power to defeat it. Because greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. And then verse 7, very important, listen, verse 7 of Psalm 57 says this, David said, Lord, my heart is steadfast, O God, and he says it again, my heart is steadfast. So number five is this, in this moment, in this season, you have to take control of your emotions. David said, Lord, I'm in a cave, and you said I was going to be in a palace, some of you are saying, I'm in my, the cave of my living room, the cave of my house. And Lord, you said in 2020, it was going to be my year. David said, Lord, while I'm here waiting, my heart is steadfast. And he said it again, Lord, my heart is steadfast. See, it's so easy to get your eyes on your circumstances. It's so easy to hear all the different news and the voices and get your eyes on the circumstances. But be like David and say, Lord, my emotions are fixed. I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in you now, just like I trusted in you when everything was perfect and everything was right. And then he goes on in the next verse, verse 8, and he says, Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. And watch what he says. He said, I will awaken the dawn. He's talking about his praise. He said, before, he said I'm going to awaken the sun. I'm going to get up before the sun rises and wake it up. And he says, bring me my lute, bring me my heart, harp. And he says, I'm going to begin to stro stroke the strings of that harp. I'm going to begin to play music unto the Lord. I'm going to begin to sing songs of worship to the Lord. I'm going to wake. In other words, he said, the first thing I do when I wake up and I wake the sun up, I'm going to wake the sun up with praise. And so number six is simply this. Amen. You have to order your confession. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 and verse 21, it says that the power of life and death are in the tongue. Now, I know we serve a sovereign God. He's the one who turns the switch on, turns the switch off, breathes out, allows us to breathe in. I understand all that. But the Bible still says 
that the power of life and death are in the tongue. Because the breath of God is in us, the ruach, the breath of God is in us. When we speak the word of God, there's power. There's the power of life or there's the power of death. And your words, by your words, you will be judged, the Bible says. The Bible says regarding Sodom that Sodom was destroyed. One of the reasons was because of their conversation. It was because of the way they were talking. And so we know that we've got to order our confession. Your conversation, your, your conversation has to be filled with praise. If your conversation is filled with praise while you're living in a cave, you confuse the enemy. The devil doesn't even know what to do. He thought that he would get you cussing and fussing, and there you are praising and shouting and singing, and he doesn't even know what to do. You confuse the enemy, Satan, so bad when you offer praise unto the Lord. And you get up early in the morning, you start saying, this is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the first and not the last. Come on, just begin to sing those things. Just begin to declare those things, that he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's my healer. He's Jehovah Roha, the Lord is my shepherd. He's Jehovah Shalom. He's the God my peace. And begin just to speak those things. Amen. We all have, think about it. It's easy to talk about your lack more than your supply, but you've got to realize this. Everybody who's watching me has more than we deserve. God's been so good to us. And so we need to give praise to him. The fruit of our lips. That's how we offer sacrifices to the Lord. The book of Hebrews says it's the fruit of our lips giving praise unto him. We're a blessed people. And from the cave, David orders his confession, and he begins to write songs. And he begins to write songs like, uh, like Psalm 34. And let me just read it. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. He's writing this from the cave. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. When I'm in the palace, when I'm in the cave, I'm going to praise him. Only two times to praise God when you feel like it and when you don't. And he said, my soul shall make boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I love that verse. I just had to put these reading glasses on to be able to see my Bible. Now, the words are on the Bible. It's there, but I can't see it. It's there, and God is here you may not see him, you may not feel him right now in your moment that you're in, you may not hear him, but that's what David said. David looked around and it looked like everything was out of focus and everything was out of vision. And he said, come on, put your magnifying glasses of faith because when I put those glasses on, it didn't change the print on the page, but it changed my perspective and my perception. And when you put the magnifying glasses of faith on and you stop looking through the prism of fear and you start looking through the prism of faith and you stop looking through the prism of panic and you start looking through the prism of praise, all of a sudden the Lord, you realize how big he is and that he's bigger than anything that we're facing. Amen. And so you need to know tonight that God cares for you. He has a plan for you. And I guess number seven is just this. That God will complete what he's began. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times as our musicians get ready. See, you can walk through the trial. David wrote that entire psalm of Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Come on, he said, oh, come and let us exalt. Let's magnify the Lord together and let us exalt his name together. See, David did all that. David said all that from the cave. Because you need to know you can walk through the trial and still have a praise. And here's something else that David wrote that I want to read to you just as we close this morning. Because David wrote another psalm about getting through the cave and through the tough times. And here's what he says in this psalm, the 23rd division of psalm. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
hear me today. Hear, hear the words of David, this, this cave dweller who became a king. He said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. It'll follow you from your father's house to the palace, David said, when you're the chief musician. It'll follow you all the way to the cave when you're hiding for your life. And then he'll follow you to the palace when you're wearing the crown and you're wearing the robe. And you know, man, just a few, I got to tell this quickly, just a few days ago, weeks ago, I was in Israel. And my favorite place in Israel, my favorite place, is a place called En Gedi. It's the place where David was in a cave and the Bible tells us that Saul was pursuing him. Same, same event, same context, same story. And David was, Saul was pursuing David. And Saul, David was in a cave. And Saul and his men were pursuing David. And it looked as if Saul had an advantage over David. And David was running. He was fleeing, hiding in the cave. You know the story. David saw that Saul was there and he was sleeping. And David... This man saw who was trying to take his life. David had an opportunity that he could have went over there, taken his sword, and was even encouraged to do so, and taken Saul out. Problem solved. Everything's over. But David respected the anointing that was upon Saul, and it says that he cut a piece of his garment. Later, he regretted even doing that. He cut a piece of Saul's garment, and you know the rest of the story that Saul came out, and David said, Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't. I spared you. And then David repented before the Lord even for doing that and as I was at En Gedi I realized that this would have been the place where that happened the Bible tells us that it says it was at En Gedi now what you need to know about En Gedi is it's in the it's in the middle of a desert there's nothing but sand and cavernous dry mountains and the Bible even says regarding En Gedi that it was steep cliffs that only the goats could walk up on its ledges it's still what it looks like today but what's amazing about that is in the middle of this desert, miles and miles of desert, at En Gedi, there is a, a, a waterfall and a spring. I believe that's where David would have written Psalm 23 when he said, you make me, you lead me beside still waters. That's where David may have been when he wrote, as a deer panteth for the water, so my soul panteth after thee. And David would have been in that cave. Saul was pursuing him. And here's what the Lord spoke to me in my first trip there in that moment. It's the reason it will always be my favorite place. Because when David was anointed king, it seemed that he had one setback before he ever got started because he was anointed king and then he had to go right back to taking care of sheep. Now, you just got the promotion of being the king of Israel. And you go back to shoveling sheep dung and leading old, leading old sheep. Dirty, nasty, stubborn sheep. And I'm sure there's time that David was asking, just like some of you may be asking, God, why am I here? Why am I going through this? Why am I having to face this? But when you stand it in Gedi, it all comes together, and you realize the reason David had to take care of those sheep is because God was getting him ready for what he had ready for him. And David knew where that waterfall was at because he had had to lead his sheep to that waterfall many times. And David knew where all those caves were because David had been out there for a long time taking care of sheep and, and taking shelter in those caves. So while you fast forward and Saul was pursuing David and it looked like Saul had an advantage over David, it's a false perception because the reality is David's experience gave him an advantage over Saul. And I'm telling you tonight, how do you behave in a cave? You just trust that God is getting you ready for what he has ready for you. I want you to look in your heart this morning. In this moment, with everything else shut down around you, when, when there's no NASCAR to watch right now, there's no NFL, there's no NBA, there's no MLB, there's, there's none of that. And, and right now, God is stripped away. I, I really believe that. That in some ways, maybe God has stripped away all of that. 
And right now, he's got you in a season where you can, you can take your family. Many of you are gathered right now in your living room around a Bible, around a TV, hearing the Word of God. And I just believe that right now, God's speaking to some of you and telling you that in this season, God has shut all the noise out so that you can hear from him. And right now, he's speaking to you. Do you hear him? Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, my plans for you are good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Listen, Jesus is coming soon. All that we're going through right now, it is just but the beginning of sorrows, the Bible calls it. And while I do believe that God has a great plan for us before he takes us out of this world, I also believe that this earth is groaning. The Bible says it is groaning like a woman in birth. And the pains that we're feeling right now are just the increase of the birth pains. As a woman gets closer and closer to the time of delivery, those contractions, those pains get closer and closer and closer. And that's why we're having earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence. Earthquakes in diverse places, even right now at the same time, because this world is groaning for the coming of the Lord. And when he comes, it could be tonight, it could be tonight, it could be today, before the sun goes down on this day, Jesus could come back for the church. What do I mean the church? I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about for those who have accepted him and received him as their Savior. And he's Listen, there's a heaven to gain, there's a hell to avoid. But not everybody's going to heaven. The Bible says only those who have called into the Lord and asked Jesus into their life and have the blood applied to their life, they're the ones that are going. The Bible says that no sin is going to enter in. And God says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. It doesn't say they wouldn't. It says they should not perish. We have a choice. God would that none would perish, but that all would come to everlasting life. And you can do that right now. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, right now, in this cave that you may be in, why don't you call out to him and say, Lord, I've tried it by myself long enough. I've tried to do it my way long enough. And God, I'm willing to give it a chance and say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. In just a few days, we're going to celebrate an empty tomb. Because Jesus went to the cross, he went to the grave, he went to Sheol, he took the keys of death, hell and the grave, he conquered hell, death and the grave. He got up on the third day, ascended to heaven, he's going to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we may be also. And sir, ma'am, I so desperately want you to go with me. And you can go, you can go today if you'll allow that spirit of God that's tugging at your heart right now, convicting you, if you'll allow that spirit to draw you to a place of prayer. And right now you can make your couch, your car, your coffee table, your end table. You can make it an altar. It doesn't have to be right here. It's right where you are. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. I want to pray for you right now. And if you don't know the Lord, would you just pray with me as I pray for you? Father, I ask you to come into my life. Come on, say these words with me. I ask you to come into my life. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, for I have sinned. And I know that I am not where I need to be in relationship with you. But Lord, I believe that you sent your son, Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. And I ask you to place that blood upon my heart to forgive me of my sins. And Lord, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And I will serve you as you give me the grace and the mercy to do it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, the Bible says there's rejoicing among the angels for everyone who comes to the Lord. Can we praise God this morning? Come on, just give God praise for everybody who I believe is coming home. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer and you want to take the next step, there's somebody that can help you with that. And, and we're not here to, to ask you for anything. We want to give to you. I've got a book I want to give you. We'll mail it to you. And if you'll just call the number or you'll go to that website, opcathome.tv. There's a, a place to click there that will, has an icon that says next steps. If you'll click that and just check 
Today I made Jesus Christ my Lord. We'll follow up with you. We'll make sure that you're able to take that next step that you need to take with the Lord. And I just believe that many, many people that are watching today are going to come to Jesus. It's the greatest decision you've ever made, I promise you. It'll be the greatest decision you've ever made. You'll never be the same. And guess what? We're on our way to heaven. And if this whole world gets worse, heaven and earth may pass away. Amen. But we're on our way to a place called heaven where Jesus is. There's no pain, no sorrow, no death, no trouble, no disease, no coronavirus. We're going there. Amen. You're going with me. I can't wait. We're going to see each other. We're going to walk on streets of gold. We're going to shout and rejoice and celebrate that God's faithful. I love you. I am praying for you. I'm here for you if I can help you. They're going to sing us out, and we're going to leave today worshiping. Amen? Things are looking up. This too shall pass. God is good, and He's faithful all the time. Good day. I love you.